the American dream is, I want to make a better life for my kid. Education is the most important part of that. These are future citizens, and I want them to be really well educated, to be smart and caring. Even if one student were to not be successful, I feel like we failed. Somehow we've got to figure out in Oregon how to fix our revenue system and take a step forward as a society. School doesn't look today like it did when most Oregonians went to school. It certainly doesn't look like it did when I went to school, and it certainly doesn't look the same even a few years ago when my own children were in school. And it's costing more to be able to educate each and every student. And right now in Oregon, we're graduating at about 77%. So one in four of our students is not making it across the finish line. We need to get the message out that our schools need to be fully and adequately funded in the state of Oregon. Measure 5 passed on the night I was elected governor. Everybody who was supporting it says not to worry. Your property taxes are going to be cut and the schools are protected because every dollar the schools lost, the state was required to replace those dollars. That was well and good if the state had the dollars, but they didn't. What we did to ourselves was create a tax framework that was unsustainable to take care of schools. It is something that for almost 30 years has sat unsolved. So I'm sitting with a speaker one day and I said, we ought to do what we did with the Transportation Committee, where we created a tremendous joint committee, went all over the state, public hearings, and created this transportation plan, which in the end surprised everybody. I tried to choose people that were on the standing committees that relate most closely to revenue and education as much as possible. To go out to every single corner of the state of Oregon and listen, and listen, and listen. It has been a passion my whole life to try to figure out how do we interact with everybody. Our job as educators is to make sure that everybody who walks into that classroom has the opportunity to be successful. In order to continue to create a world that will live on after we're gone, the most important thing you can do is educate kids. And we need to do everything we can to provide kids with enough support so that your zip code is not your destiny. So that if you live in a rural area, you're not predetermined to have less success because your school has less opportunity. I don't recall in my legislative career a group of legislators, Democrat and Republican, House and Senate, together going to every part of Oregon to try to learn from the teachers, the students, the parents, administrators, the general public about schools in all corners of the state. And then I will also warn you that we're currently limiting testimony to two minutes per person. However, oh. and there will be a timer in front of you so you know exactly how much time you have left. You won't be surprised. Oh, I gotta go up there. Yeah. Oh. But they're all really nice. They're here specifically to listen to you guys. Mm -hmm. It will be the committee that comes up with the policies that we think should be changed. It'll also be the committee that creates the revenue package. I'm hoping for a miracle. So welcome this evening to this traveling show we call the Joint Committee on Student Success. Our goal is to figure out how do we get a sustainable source of income for our schools. 
So we go out and listen around the state, gathering the information and trying to figure out how does this all come together? What are those connections between all of our donors? And if there's one thing I've found is that people want to be heard. Today I am here to speak, hopefully on behalf of all students, in regards to mental health. Mental health is a safety issue, not only for the school itself, but for the students. Bottom line, I'm asking you to be helpful to all of us, and in some cases, I guess I'm asking you to save us. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. So we have to figure out what Oregon and Oregon's people believe is what we want for our kids. And once we decide that, then we have to look at it and say, now here's what we want, how best do we provide that? And then and finally, um, what does it cost? We're going for it. I don't care whether it's a billion, I don't care if it's two billion, I don't care three billion, I don't care. You just tell me what it's gonna cost, and this is the tax mechanism we're gonna use, and that money goes to them and that's it. It doesn't go to the general fund, over. It will be dedicated just to the early childhood, preschool, K through 12. This is do or die time, this is do or die time. One thing that is unique about Oregon is that for much of the last several decades, school districts are used to spending about 10% of their payroll to help fund the pension system. That number is eventually going to rise to about 30% of payrolls. Each one percentage point of payroll is the equivalent of a day of school delivered statewide. So in essence, this extra money that we are using to fund problems from the past is costing us the equivalent of 20 days of school. I'll come get you. Okay. Are you ready now? Okay. All right, I'll be there in a bit. You are my favorite daughter. Come on. <laughs> Should we do a break and I'll put your hair in a man bun? My kids are both in public school. My son's going to be a sophomore and my daughter's going to be an eighth grader. And I always say that my kids starting public school turned my belief in public education from an abstract to a concrete. There is no magical department of waste, fraud, and abuse that we can get rid of and then have enough money in order to provide everything we want. School days are yeah. six hours. 165. God, that's depressing. What? Emmett? What? Do you know how many hours of school you're supposed to get every year? No. 990. There's this disconnect that, you know, cutting taxes is good and raising taxes is bad, but you know what taxes are? They're the way we pay for services. In the last 10 years, we had to cut, during our worst times, over 300 teachers. Class sizes have gone up. There was a year where, you know, in high school, you might see 40 to 50 students in a class. We had to not continue with some of our career technical education programs. One year we even had to close schools for a few days to make sure that we had enough funding to finish out the school year. Today we are about $2 billion short of an adequate funding level for the Oregon K-12 system. If you were to look at your household budget, you'd look at the $2 billion split between cost and revenue, and you'd look at what you could reasonably raise in revenue, and you'd look at the expenses that are more easily adjusted over time, and you would work on both sides of the model. Today, we're just not having that conversation in Oregon. The big challenge is when you invest in education, but it's spent on expense components in the education model that don't reach the student, you start to just feel hopeless. You want to see a system where education dollars are reaching the classroom. He's, one of the co he's the co-chair, Senator Roblin from Coos Hi, Hello. I'm Susie. Susie. Really the biggest challenge, whether it's members on the committee, whether it's parents that we hear from, whether it's administrators, is to get past your own personal experience with your education or your kid's education and think and talk more broadly about what's best for everybody. How do you get all those individual inputs and opinions and put them into something that is going to do the most good for the most amount of people? And the best teachers who are making calls in the evenings and texting and emailing, they don't have enough time in their schedule and they're not paid for that. They, they, don't, they do it for free. <laughs> we need to do everything we can to really make it so that no matter where you are, you have the same opportunity for success. And I think the citizens of Oregon, when they pay their taxes, myself included, we expect 
every kid to graduate with some solid basic skills and then the opportunities to define who they want to be. Kids know that they're not getting as much as they used to, right? They know they're not getting band and they know they're not getting choir and they know they're not getting PE and all of those things that I experienced as a kid and it makes them feel less like school is there for them. Please make sure that as you write that you're thinking about positive experiences that you've had, maybe things that you've learned. Schools are different than they were when I went to school 30, 40 years ago. When the traditional citizen thinks about our schools, they think about what they went to. And it's different because now our schools are essentially social service agencies as well. They're taking care of the whole child versus just taking care of education. So mental health, behavioral health, physical health, all those things are now taking place in our public school setting. So teachers aren't just teaching anymore. They are essentially taking care of the whole child. I like to ask people when we're doing this, assuming that you had more money, what would you be doing differently with it? The escalated behavioral challenges that we're seeing, we're hearing that from all of our K-12 partners. What can we do as a state that would let you, as a district, as a school, do things better for students, but that wouldn't be too much of a heavy hand down? I started my career in Medford in 1990, right out of college. I was like 22 years old, and I've been here ever since. Hey, good morning, everybody. Teaching has changed so much since I started in 1990s. More and more teachers are taking the role of parents because we just need to. The other part of the equation is we got to take care of our teachers. They need to make a fair wage. They need to have a benefit package that allows them to be a normal human being and have a family and have a life. Be able to retire when it's retirement time. Revenues are up. But we have to be looking at the expense side of the ledger as well. And there's going to have to be compromise from all folks. And so part of what this committee is going to have to do is figure out how do we tell Oregonians what they're going to buy with their money. One of the solutions to revenue reform so is to do what the legislature is doing right now and going around and listening because every community has its own unique needs. I think a big problem is that people are afraid of going to counselors for help, partly because they're scared of having the idea that like, oh, I need to go to a counselor, I need help, I'm not doing good enough. One of the first things that we decided was kids first, so we hear kids every time we go, wherever we go. We have tablets, we have laptops, but they're kind of outdated a little bit. A newer technology would really help us and come in handy. Sometimes it feels like your only option is college. It, it doesn't really feel like there's much else that you can do and, and still be successful. Out of those connections will emerge this understanding of what do Oregonians want their education system to be and do, and how are we going to go about doing that and funding it in a sustainable way that doesn't have the ups and downs that our tax system has. We're in this together. Let's solve this problem together.